reading comes from John chapter 7, verses 37 to 39. And you can find that on page 100 in the New Testament section. On the last day of the festival, the great day, while Jesus was standing there, he cried out, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me, and let the one who believes in me drink. As the scripture has said, out of the believer's heart shall flow rivers of living water. Now he said this about the Spirit, which believers in him were to receive. For as yet there was no Spirit, because Jesus was not yet glorified. The word of the Lord. What a joy it is to be with me, to be with you and with me. It's not always a joy to be with me, let me assure you of that. That's my family. But uh, what a joy it is to be with you on this first Pentecost Sunday. We are sharing the liturgical year together. We started in January and now here we are at Pentecost, going into what we call ordinary time in the life of the church. And we will start resuming that special time again when we come to the time of Advent. So what a joy it is to, to share uh, this day with you. In 1955, Walt Disney and Disney Studios were at the peak of both national and international success. Lady and the Tramp was about to be released as the first animation to be filmed in Cinemascope. And Disney was advancing his empire in the relatively new medium of television and finding that to be very successful. But Disney's pride and joy was his new project about to open near Anaheim, California. Disney had always felt, especially when he took his children to amusement parks, that these parks were seedy and limited in scope and imagination. He felt he could do better. And so he set out to transform that section of the entertainment industry. Disneyland would be a kind of park that had never been seen or even imagined. Clean, safe, and built upon the creative genius of the Disney animators and engineers. Disney himself wasn't sure if the concept of a theme park would catch on with the public. And his doubts were reinforced when three years earlier than 1955, he had initially presented the idea to the city council of Burbank, California. Burbank rejected the proposal to build Disneyland on the outskirts of their city, citing that such a large amusement facility would create hideous traffic, noise, and according to the council itself, bring in the riffraff associated with carnivals and fairgrounds. That's their language. Amusement park owners themselves expressed their belief that beyond doubt, the park would not last the year, that it would close within the first year. But all of this kind of criticism and advice did not dissuade Walt Disney, who was not a very dissuadable person. Having finally secured a swath of acreage just adjacent to the Santa Ana Freeway, Disneyland began construction in July of 1954 with the impossible goal, literally impossible goal, of opening in July. 1955, one year later. The park was not nearly ready when opening day arrived. But Disney decided to open it anyway and invite the media from all over the world to attend, along with 5,000 ticketed guests. The result was a jamboree of confusion and calamity. As the LA Times stated in an article about the opening, 
Traffic was backed up for seven miles on the Santa Ana Freeway. Boy, the, the city council people at Burbank were looking pretty good at that point, weren't they? And the 5,000 expected guests mushroomed to 28,000 thanks to scores of counterfeit tickets. Flames, flames, fire, lit at Sleeping Beauty Castle because of a gas leak. Water washed across the overloaded deck of the Mark Twain Riverboat Ride. Ron Reagan, who was one of the television broadcast hosts, was forced to scale the wall of Frontierland to make one of his scheduled appearances. And even at one point, Disney got locked in his apartment above the fire station and he could not get out. He had to call real fire people, firemen, to get rescued from his fake fire station. After the madness of opening day, Disney and his new park, as you would expect, were roundly criticized in the press. Newspaper headlines declared, Walt's Nightmare. The media predicted a quick and early demise to Disney. And as it turned out, the media was, as it sometimes is, mistaken. Within two months, two months, 60 days, of that disastrous opening, the park welcomed its one millionth visitor. 60 days. And as of today, June 4th, 2017, over 750 million visitors have made their way to what became known as the happiest place on earth. To put it another way, Walt Disney threw a party, threw a party for the world in 1955, and people responding to Disney's vision and that invitation are still coming there today to celebrate long after Disney has been gone. 2,000 years ago, one who was even greater than Disney, much greater than all of us, threw a party for the world. And while many greeted that party's first day with criticism and confusion and cynicism, the party still goes on. With an attendance record that is even beyond the reach of Walt Disney's imagination. We are attending that party today. We, along with millions of Christians all over the world, come to Pentecost. A celebration to recognize the age of the Holy Spirit, initiated by God, given to us through Christ, and as real and as present today as it was that first day in first century Jerusalem. In the Jewish religion of Christ's day, Pentecost was a celebration of the wheat harvest, the wheat harvest, which took place on a different day of the year, but always between the months of May or June, sometime in that time. It was a pilgrim festival. And by pilgrim festival, I mean Jews from all over the world, the known world at that time, would travel, would come to the temple in Jerusalem to participate. Throughout the Gospels, Jesus had made a promise to his followers. After he was gone, they would receive a new kind of power. A power which they would share directly with him and with God. In the Gospel of John, Jesus identifies this promised gift as he stands in the temple on the last day of what was called the Festival of the Booths, another harvest festival, but in the fall. This is what he said. Let anyone who is thirsty come to me, and let anyone who believes in me drink. As the scripture has said, out of the believer's heart shall flow rivers of living water. John goes on to say, Now Jesus said this about the Spirit, which believers in Him were to receive. 
For as yet there was no spirit, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Now Jesus said this at the festival of the moons, which as I said, was the celebration of the fall harvest. The last celebration before the time of winter. It's interesting to look at these festivals and how they match up with Jesus' work. If we look at the progression of these festivals in the Gospels and relate them to the ministry of Christ, we can see the sum total of Christ's work leading right up to the day of Pentecost, which was called by the Jews the Feast of Weeks. Jesus announces the coming of the Spirit at the fall celebration of the last harvest, just before winter. He then goes to his death and resurrection during the time of Passover in the spring. After the dead of winter, spring comes, and Jesus rises. At that time when new life springs into abundance. And then at Pentecost, the disciples received the gift that Jesus had promised them not long after the Passover. A gift which in the Jewish religious tradition commenced the harvest, but for Christians commenced a spiritual harvest. You see how that all matches up? It commenced a spiritual harvest. The fact that Jesus promised the gift of the Holy Spirit, promised it while teaching at the Festival of the Booths is important. The Festival of the Booths centered its sacramental activity on water. It was the tradition of the priest to stand behind an altar that had two gutters on either side. And those gutters came together in front of the people in the middle. On the last day, the climax of the festival, a priest on one side would pour water into one gutter, and a priest on the other side would pour wine. And the two sacramental elements would meet in the middle, in front of the people. This represented God's promise to Israel that after the cold and dark of winter, spring would return, the seed would grow, the rain would fall. And the fields would yield this harvest so that life on earth may continue. Jesus took this imagery of pouring out water and wine and applied it to the new life that he was about to bring to all creation. The life of the Holy Spirit. The life eternal. Which would pour itself, literally pour itself, into the hearts of all believers and which would flow out of the hearts of those same hearts as Christ's church in the world. Just as Christ transformed the Passover into the Eucharist, that which we celebrate today, He promised that God would transform Pentecost from a celebration of hope for another year of food to a celebration of a new age an age without count of years, an age without days, an age without rituals, an age of transformation that to this day is still transforming the world. When God builds an engine, it really lasts. It keeps going and going and going. You might recall the story of that first day of Pentecost from Acts. You, you recall it. It's a well-known story. You recall that at that event, as the tongues of fire lit, lit above people, as they began to speak, there was a great deal of confusion and a lot of criticism about what was going on. Astonished Jewish pilgrims Remember, they were from all over the known world, so they were going to take the message back with them of what they saw. Heard the followers of Christ speaking in their own languages. The disciples were not babbling nonsense. 
but they were doing exactly what we're doing today and what Christians have been doing for 2,000 years. Declaring the good news of the love and salvation of Jesus Christ. That dynamic still drives the age of the Spirit as we continue in it. For we who believe the Spirit-driven life is one of discipleship, and it's a life of celebration, a joyous response to the grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ, a response lived out in an infinite variety of ways, but always grounded, always fixed, in the same spirit. But just like that day, 2,000 years ago, there are others who believe that Christians are little more than fools, mad fools, clinging to a desperate belief in a corrupted organization light years from its long dead leader. Same noises that we heard on that day of Pentecost. 2,000 years ago. But we have to remember that just because some refuse to believe, refuse to join us for the party, that doesn't change the party itself that started at Pentecost. God is still throwing that party and inviting the world to come and join. And we know that countless souls have joined, experiencing the transformation of the Holy Spirit. And that is why you and I, we must never, the church must never stop inviting and must never stop celebrating. However, the Spirit leads us to celebrate. So on this Pentecost, we come to the table, not just to break bread and pour wine, but through the acts of breaking bread and pouring wine, to let the Holy Spirit pour out the life and love of God into our hearts. Through this sound, into our hearts. What a joy it is to know such a God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. What a joy it is to be loved for who we are, what a joy it is to love and care for others in the name of Christ as the Spirit leads us. Truly, it is the greatest party ever. And it is ours not just to enjoy. It is ours to share. So let us do so as we prepare our hearts for the table.